Good afternoon and welcome to the Tempe City Council regular council meeting for July 27th, 2017 here in the Harry E. Mitchell Government Center. For all those that are able, could you please rise for an invocation? Wait, are you doing it? I'll do it. No. no. Oh. Dave is doing it. Oh, you're doing it. Go ahead. Well, uh, Mayor, as is my custom in lieu of a uh, public prayer, I'll pray to myself. I encourage others to do so if they wish. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I think we have Councilmember QB on the phone. That's right. Welcome, Lauren. All right. Next item Thank on our you. agenda is our council meeting minutes. Councilmember Keating. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Keating, seconded by Vice Mayor Erdano Savage. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Moving forward, Council Member Keating. Thank you, Mayor. I move we approve items B1 through 12. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Navarro. It's been moved by Council Member Keating, second by Council Member Navarro. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Aye. That motion does carry forward. Next item is the reports and announcements. I'm going to come down real quick. Today, I'd like to bring awareness to a tragic yet important issue, drowning. Unfortunately, drowning can take lives every year. And further, these deaths are 100% preventable. It's a critical that we bring awareness to water safety at the pool, on a trip to the river, or even at bath time. We can't do enough to bring awareness to this important issue. Our Fire Medical Rescue Department does incredible work to educate our community about water safety and drowning prevention in partnership with community, community organizations like Phoenix Children's Hospital. We thank them for their work to prevent drownings and save lives every day. I'd like to have the uh, Chief Reese come down. I'd like to read a proclamation. It states, whereas Arizona's future prosperity depends upon the long-term health, safety, and well-being of nearly 2 million children and teens in our state, and whereas drowning is a top cause of injury and death for children and teens in Arizona, affecting the victims, families, emergency personnel, and our society as a whole. And whereas child drownings are nearly 100% preventable, including drownings which are classified as maltreatment and make up an average of one in four cases in Arizona. And whereas research proven strategies can save lives, including constant supervision, restricting access to water, use of life jackets, swimming lessons for adults and children, rapid emergency response, including CPR, and evidence-based programs to bring these strategies to families in the best way to save lives. And whereas keeping children, teens, and adults healthy and safe is a goal of the Tempe Fire and Medical Rescue Department and other drowning prevention organizations in Maricopa County, raising awareness with all increased understandings and education of effective ways to prevent drownings. And whereas during the month of August, the City of Tempe, in collaboration with the Phoenix Children's Hospital, state and local governments, community organizations, and private citizens will begin engaging communities throughout Arizona in coordinated and in a comprehensive response. Now, therefore, I, Mark Mitchell, Mayor of Tempe, Arizona, do hereby declare as August 2017 as Drowning Impact Awareness Month. Chief, thank you. Manager, do you have any announcements? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to uh, cede my time over with your permission to City Clerk Brigitte Kuiper. Thank you. 
Um, I have the pleasure of introducing a new staff member to not only the council, but to the public. Um, after 30 years, our prior Deputy City Clerk, Kay Savard, is retiring or has retired. So we have a new Deputy City Clerk. Her name is Dusty Christofferson, and she is somewhere in the back assisting people with agendas and wanted to introduce her to the public and welcome her to the City of Tempe. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Next item is our consent agenda. All the items listed on the consent agenda will be considered as a group and will be enacted with one motion by the City Council. Unless an item is removed for separate consideration, members of the public may remove any public hearing items for separate consideration. Public hearing items are designated with an asterisk and council members, council members may remove any item for separate consideration. If you do wish to speak on a public hearing item, please fill out a speaker's card at the back of the room and please hand it to our city clerk and I'll call your name and it's your turn to speak. And now the uh, consent agenda is as follows. Miscellaneous items, items 5A1 through 5A14. <coughs> Awards and bids and contracts, items 5B1 through 5B25. With the exception of 5B13, which has been removed from the agenda at the request of our staff. And resolutions, items 5C1 through 5C4. Again, is there anyone in the audience wishing to have a public hearing item that I just read removed for separate consideration? Could you please get my attention? Seeing none, I'll look to my colleagues. Councilmember Granville. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Item 5A6. Okay. Anything else? Is there Mr. a Mayor? motion? Yes, Councilmember QB. Mr. Mayor, um, yes, 5A6 for me as well, and 5B16. 5B16. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as read with the exception of 5A6, 5B13, and 5B16? Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Shapiro, seconded by Vice Mayor Ernano Savage. Please vote. Councilmember Cuby. Aye. That motion passes seven to zero. We will take the items in order. Items 5A6, Councilmember Granville, which is, I think, the neighborhood grants. Um, the approved recommendation of the Marianne Quarter grant program funding for fiscal year 17-18 and the amount of $205, $205,000, $360 for neighborhood associations and various neighborhood projects. Councilman Randall. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, you know, uh, we're in a similar situation to where we were last year. And last year, Council was particularly generous, and I believe we raised the amount by, I want to say, $50,000. And we're in a similar situation this year where um, there were, after we eliminated the, after staff, I should say, I had nothing to do with it, after staff eliminated the requests that didn't meet the criteria because it was upkeep and maintenance, because it was, the HOA wasn't, you know, coming in with half or it was something like that. It was still a case where there were $300,000 in requests, but only $200,000 available. Um, and that's with some additional money for, um, for uh, through public works for the sort of specialized program that we have. Um, and I looked over some of the ones that we, that weren't getting funding. Um, and it's Clark Park for an activity pad in their park. Mitchell Park wanted a concrete chess table. Um, Optimus Park actually had four neighborhood associations go in together, um, which I can't imagine getting four neighborhood associations to agree on anything. Uh, but even they got their money reduced, as, long, as well as Papago Park got their money reduced. Uh, Brentwood Cavalier just wanted lighting uh, for their neighborhood, and that got denied. Uh, Park Riviera wanted uh, information for their dogs. The list goes on and on. A pool fence was one of them that got turned down. Um, and I, I, what I would ask is, uh, you know, at the request of the council, that may, perhaps we, because we have so many people that put time into this and that staff deemed as worthy, but simply funded because of no funding, no additional funding, that maybe we could do the same thing again that we did last year, and that is add an additional $50,000 to this um, because the selection process has already taken place and, and, and give it to staff to determine who the next people in the order would be. And, and candidly, I think from a CIP standpoint, I would much rather, if we're getting 
$300,000 requests every year. Uh, I think this is some of the best money that we spend because, one, for the items, but two, because it gives neighbors reasons to get together and talk uh, when they might not otherwise do so. And so I think from a community building standpoint, it's sometimes just as valuable as the what gets built and the ownership standpoint of it. And with that, I think I would leave it to council to, uh, to see if, if there's you know, a desire to increase this amount. I, I don't think there's not a desire to increase amount. I think we're, we're, we're dealing with the amount of monies that we have in our budget. I'll ask Ken, Mr. Jones, could you come down? I mean, this is something that we probably should have brought up during the budget cycle. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's been an ongoing discussion for sure. I know, but okay. Mr. Jones, if, if we were to entertain something of this magnitude, one, how would we pay for it and where would we come up with the money? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ken Jones, Deputy City Manager. Um, the, the budget has been established, so that would mean a movement of funds from one, from another source to this source. You have contingency money that you could you could transfer to there. Uh, there's no way to increase the total budget, so obviously we have to move it from somewhere. Um, we we could give you a list of options if that's the council's pleasure. We could come back to a future meeting and give you the, the list of options of where we could transfer that budget authority from. Councilman Navarro. Man, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, and I. I agree with Councilman Granville on the fact of you know the money is well spent and, and it does well, but um, I, I get a little fearful of the last minute. Hey, we need to add this, add this because we've had council meetings before where we're starting to add a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, I agree. Um, we need to have a discussion. I think we've even talked about a discussion on certain um, areas of money where we'd like to allocate funds to. Um, I would like to have this as a discussion. I'm not saying to. Um, kick it the can down the road, but I would like to have the retreat discussion possibly be able to um, deal with the sources of money that we have that we can fund things and how we're going to fund things um, just so we can be a little bit more, uh, I want to say good stewards with our money and just to make sure that we're doing things appropriately instead of last minute. I agree with you. This is a good program. I'm not going to um, knock that down, but just the funding and just how we're doing it. Um, I'd rather uh, wait against other options and just see what we have. Does that make sense? Vice Mayor Adana Savage. I, I thank you, Mayor. I guess I just you know my two cents is I agree with Councilmember Navarro I, and and Councilmember Granville at the same time. I do think this is um, a great bang, a good uh, bang for our buck in the sense of being able to get those neighborhoods together and and create a really cool project that I think the neighborhood can be proud of. I think that is definitely one of the values of this program. I think that's why we've held on to it for so long, even when the times were tough. Uh, one of the things that we always wanted to make sure we did was hang on to um, our neighborhood grant program. Uh, the one thing that I guess if, if we're going to talk about increasing the funding, which I'm not opposed to doing, I think we can definitely have that discussion. I'm not really prepared to say, yes, let's do that tonight, because I don't think that would be the, um, the wisest thing to do and the best uh, fiscally thing to do at this time. Um, but at the same time, I, if we do have that conversation, like uh, Councilmember Navarro said, I want to talk about some of those neighborhoods that have not applied. I mean, it's kind of one of those things I continue to bring up is how do we get more neighborhoods to be engaged and, and to come together and actually work together to create something that benefits for the entire neighborhood. So I'd rather have like more of a comprehensive conversation and talk about how we can increase the funding and how we can increase the neighborhoods that participate too. So I'm, I mean, if you wanna bring back, I'm fine if you wanna bring back some ideas and thoughts. I don't think this is the time or place to do that or to make a decision right now. Um, but I definitely wanna have that larger discussion and see how we can um, definitely implement the program better. Councilman Granville? Yeah, I, you know, I, I respect that. I just, I, I wanted to bring up the issue because it's important to me. Uh, it's a little bit of a catch-22, unfortunately, in that uh, when we're doing our CIP, we don't know how many, how many requests we're going to get. But then once we've done our CIP, uh, and now we're at the, the voting part of the grants, now we know, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like in the one point, you don't know how many applications you're going to get, and at the other point, it's too late. And so I think maybe to solve this problem moving forward, because I, I agree, you don't want to do things last minute, um, could we could we get something just for maybe the last five years of here's the amount that we've granted each of the last five years and here's the amount of applicable applications we've gotten after you sort of exclude the ones that don't meet the criteria. Um, and so that when we have our retreat, we could talk about this in the larger CIP discussion and say, look, if there's been a sustained shortfall and we all acknowledge, as I think we do, that this is some of the best money we spend from a community building standpoint and from an ownership standpoint, 
then maybe it's time to have a discussion and say, look, maybe you know, shorting something one third of the need is not where we should be anymore. Um, but I think we need that longer chart maybe to see, is this a trend or is it just been the last two or three years? Yeah, and who applies and who doesn't, right? And that's, that's one of the other things. I see the trend. Yeah, because unfortunately, one of the issues that comes up with this, unlike uh, one of the other things on our agenda, which is the arts program, um, you know, if, if you fund it at an 80% level, they still do work. They just do less of it. But almost, almost all of these neighborhood grants, they're building a thing, right? And it costs $4,000 for the art or $9,000 for the gazebo. And so if you fund that $9,000 gazebo, $8,000, you don't get you don't get most of a gazebo. You get no gazebo, right? And so uh, so consequently, it's often an all or none proposition with some of these grants, which is why you don't see very much partial funding. You see three or four people who just got nothing, unfortunately. And I just want to be clear for the record: every single council member cares about our neighborhoods Absolutely. and the grants. This is not one particular issue that is more important to another member of this body. With that being said, this Mr. program Mayor? is not funded through CIP. This is funded through our general fund. So when it, this money comes out of our general fund. And I, I think it is important to have a five-year, um, if we could come back, even if we do at the retreat, we're adding stuff to our retreat as we speak, to talk about our neighborhood grant programs and what we're funding. In a perfect world, we'd like to have as much money as possible to fund all the programs, but we all know that's not realistic. And that's why we have a process. And all these programs have gone through a process. So if there was more money, there may have been other things that could have been funded that may not have been the list that you read, Councilman Grandma, but there may be some other things that fit the criteria if more money was given. It's no different than how we handle some of the other agency reviews that we have and some other fundings that, the programs that we offer. So I would encourage, and, and I'll ask staff um, if we could make sure that we have this as a topic at our retreat. I think if we could look at the historic trends of the last five years. Um, the, the historically, there's, a, there's active neighborhoods that, you know, the squeaky wheel has the opportunity, but we'll see what else are we looking at and how we fund the neighborhood grants. I mean, there's a budget for a reason. But that doesn't mean that we can't look at increasing those budget numbers, if that's okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilmember Kubi. Yes, I thank you, Councilmember Granville, for bringing up this topic. And I just wanted to suggest that at the retreat that we consider the Innovation Opportunity Fund, which was created through the, um, through the budget process, and that's a $500,000 amount that's meant to be spent to look at more innovative projects and such. And so that's a possible source of funding for this. And um, one of the reasons why I also wanted to remove this from the consent agenda was to talk about, you know, it's great that we have this map. I want to just salute Shauna Warner for this wonderful map that displays what the HOAs and NAs, which ones apply, which ones receive the grants, and which ones didn't apply. And like Council Member Ardona Savage, um, you know, we, it's very important to note the ones that did not apply at all. And I was hoping that, and maybe this is a discussion for the retreat, but will there be a plan to reach out to those that did not apply? I know that there's interest in uh, ASU with the EPICS engineering projects and community service program and the sustainability students to, to work with neighborhoods um, who do not traditionally apply for these. And so I think that could be a part of the, of the equation in trying to reach out to those that don't apply and build capacity in those neighborhoods. Perfect. So, so if we could talk answer. about the innovation fund. What's that? Yeah, we could, I mean, that could be a source. Um, and that's something I'm pretty sure we're going to be discussing at the retreat. Mm-hmm. So we'll add this to our retreat item. Sure. With that being said, is there a motion regarding item 5A6? So moved. It's been moved by Councilman Navarro, seconded by Vice Mayor Edna Savage. Please vote. Councilman Kiwi. Aye. That motion carries 7 to 0. Next item is item 5B16. Councilmember Kiwi. Yes, and, and sorry that I'm not there, that I can't see um, Shelly's Shelley's face. I know that Shelly worked on this um, contract, and we've moved towards the integrative um, pest control management approach, which is a wonderful thing, and I'm really pleased to see that. I just wondered how we verify that the landscaping company is indeed um, using products such as Nature's Revenge and not using Roundup. We have Shelly here is going to respond to you. Thank you, Council Member QB, Mayor, Council Members. So in order to verify, we do have two staff members that go out and periodically visit the sites. Um, they work very closely with the contractors, and in this case, it's artistic land management. Um, obviously, we can't be out there all the time, but they do know where they are working and perform 
somewhat unscheduled um, audits or inspections of the sites just to make sure that we are following those protocols. Great, and I've noticed a trend towards less formalization of the trimming on the, on the right-of-ways, which is a great thing. And um, the company, do they, do they um, train? I know that there's horticultural training and desert landscaping training, but is that done by any accredited group, like the Desert Botanical Garden, or do they show us how many or what numbers of their crew are actually trained in desert horticulture? I'm not aware that they identify within their submittals for the contract um, how many are trained. We do require that they have an arborist on staff um, to help with the trimming. This contract is not for the right-of-ways, but it actually is the same contractor that we use for the um, right-of-ways. We can verify that information, though, Councilmember QB, if you'd like to know more about that. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren. You want to go ahead and move on this? Yes, I move to approve. There's been a motion to approve item 5B16. This has been seconded by Councilman Shapiro. Please vote. Councilman Keeley. Aye. That motion passes 7 to 0. Next item on our agenda is our non consent agenda. All the items listed on the non consent agenda will be considered separately. Agenda items scheduled for introduction and first public hearing will be heard but will not be voted upon at this meeting. Agenda items scheduled for second public hearing and final adoption will be voted upon tonight. The first section of the non-consent agenda is miscellaneous items, bids, contracts, and resolutions. Item 6A1 is to consider to take action on a letter of reprimand for a violation of the code, Council Code of Conduct adopted by resolution number 2009.126. Um, this is not a public hearing item. I will look to my colleagues. Councilmember Keating. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that we approve um, as written. Are you making a motion? Yeah. So there's a motion to approve mm -hmm. item 6A1. Is there a second? Second. It's been but seconded. Is there a discussion? Well, we're going to get to that. It's been seconded by Councilman Navarro. Discussion? Councilmember QB? Yes, I. Yes, I like to speak. Um, so, you know, this is always a difficult issue when you're considering this kind of a, um, an action about one of your colleagues who you respect a lot. And, uh, and in my mind, I mean, I argued this case in the, in the, when we had this discussion in the work study, and I understand that it's the council's will and consensus to move forward with a letter of reprimand. And I advocated that it be a letter of a, an advisory letter, one sort of step below a letter of reprimand because I felt like there was consciousness and regret. And I think Councilmember Granville showed that when he removed the, uh, the offending language in the Instagram post. And I, you know, I think it was a, throw, a throwaway sort of care, carelessly thought out um, Instagram, but he remedied that, he showed regret. And in the case of the prior reprimand, there wasn't that same sort of regret. And um, so I just have a real difficulty in supporting, supporting this as a letter of reprimand. And I, I re thoroughly respect way, the way we got there. And I understand that this issue came to us and we didn't seek out this issue. And that there were findings that advocated that we must do something according to our personnel code and code of conduct. Um, there's a second issue I wanted to mention briefly and, and it's just first amendment issues that I think we're kind of starting down a little bit of a slippery slope. And I worry about that. And um, for those reasons, I will be voting no on the letter of reprimand. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? Seeing none. Oh, Councilman Spire. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I agree, actually, with all of Councilmember QB's sentiments. But I'd like to say one other thing, and that is, if we are going to go down this road with these kinds of things, we need some better procedures because spending tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money on something like this is ridiculous. And I'm not speaking to the, to the work product or um, the, the concision of the attorney that we hired to do this, but I just, I just can't imagine that any of our taxpayers out there think that this was a wise expenditure of money. So um, I'd really like us to develop some new procedures to address this type of thing. 
um, because I think that it was incredibly wasteful. And um, I also don't believe that it rises to the reprimand level. I agree with Councilmember QB. And so uh, I, I, I'll be voting no as well. Anyone? Yeah. Vice Mayor Adana Savage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess I just, I just want to take a quick second and, and just voice and just reiterate, I think, a little bit about what was said last time we had this discussion. And um, first and foremost, um, I think none of us want to be in this situation or be here today, too. But, it, you know, it's my responsibility, and I think I need to do my due diligence and, and make sure that I'm looking at um, the principles that are before me. And I, I said this earlier, I'm just going to say it again. And I think that comes down to looking at the complaint, reviewing the investigation, um, reviewing the findings and the analysis, and looking for options to be able to move forward. And I know it was the majority of the council at the time then that said, yes, we want to move forward with the letter of reprimand um, and the apology letter. And I still do support that. I think that um, that is, I think, what is warranted at the time. I do respect Councilmember uh, Kubi and, and Shapira for your thoughts and understand your perspective. Um, but I feel really strongly that I think this is the right thing to do. I think that, you know, again, I said it, uh, said it then and I'll say it again, that I think it's just really important that we continue to treat each other um, very respectfully, uh, whether we're here at the table or uh, we're out there in the audience or in the community. And um, that's one thing that I'm very passionate about and one of my values. So I will be uh, voting yes tonight. Thank you, Mayor. With that, Mayor, just one other thing. I, I just want to say to Vice Mayor Donner Savage's last point, I agree with it wholeheartedly. We have to treat each other with respect. We have to treat our members of our community with respect. I, I do want to say that a, a no vote on this is not a disagreement with that. I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with what the Vice Mayor just said. All right. Please vote. That motion carries. Oh, Councilman um, and she, Yes, no. Votes no. That motion carries 4 to 2 with Councilmember Granville abstaining. <clears throat> Next is item 6A2 is to adopt a notice of intent to enter into a retail development tax incentive agreement with MUFG Union Bank for the addition of the newly highly specialized functions at the Grand at Papago Park Center located at 1100 block of West Washington Street. I need to make a note that an affirmative vote by we need to have at least two thirds vote of the city council for this intent. Before we look at this issue, I need to make a statement that says before the city may approve or enter into a development agreement, the city council must make specific findings required by the state statute and obtain an independent third party verification. The verification will contain a financial analysis of the impact of the development agreement. The city must also find that absent the initiative or the incentive, Union Bank would not have chosen Tempe. We have economic development staff present to assist the city council in making these findings. And I ask for a presentation from Donna and Scott. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Mayor and Council, good evening. My name is Scott Powell. I'm the Economic Development Program Manager for the City of Tempe. Uh, to help you in your findings, I'm uh, going to go over a few things. So anytime we, uh, we work to attract and retain businesses, especially the eighth largest bank in the world uh, by assets under management, it's always a very, high, it's a very highly competitive process. Um, you know, through this expansion effort, uh, we've been working with uh, Union Bank and their representatives for the past year or so. And as it came to a close, it was a, the process came down between the city of Tempe, the Denver metropolitan area in Colorado, and the Charlotte metropolitan area within North Carolina. So we also had uh, Mr. John Lenio, a senior vice president with CBRE, and uh, an economist who can also speak to the competitive process that we engaged to, uh, to, uh, to gain a Union Bank's expansion. So on top of that, staff also retained uh, Rounds Consulting Group, uh, which is a third party economic firm located in Tempe to do an economic impact analysis on the project. Uh, through their analysis, they came to realize the incentive offered is about $1.15 million. And after considering that incentive, the impact to Tempe over the five years the, the incentive offer is, uh, is available uh, resulted in $2.4 million. So the impact far exceeded the uh, incentive we were given. 
So I hope with those two things, uh, myself and uh, Ms. Kennedy, your Economic Development Director, are available to answer any questions, as is Mr. Lenios in the audience that can address any questions on the selection process. Thank you, Scott. So I look to my colleagues now. When, if we're going to look for a motion, the motion, I need to make sure that the motion states that it approves the notice of intent that the findings that the incentive is presented will raise more revenue than the benefit of the tax incentive to Union Bank and that Union Bank would not locate at this site without this incentive. Is there anyone willing to make a motion? I'm just going to go so moved. It's been moved by Councilmember Granville, and your motion will include to approve the notice of intent with the findings that the incentive is, as presented, will raise more revenue than the benefit of the tax incentive to Union Bank, and that Union Bank would not locate at this site without this incentive. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm seconding that. It's been moved by Councilmember Granville and seconded by Vice Mayor Erdano Savage. Any other comments or discussion? Please vote. Councilmember Cubie. Aye. That motion passes 7 to 0. Next item is 6A3, which is to approve a two year contract renewal with IT partners for Hewlett Packard Enterprise Services and related products, accessories, and services that are used by the Internal Services Department to support numerous software applications throughout the city. Is there any comments or discussion on item 6A3? Is there a motion on item 6A3? Moved by Councilmember Keating, seconded by Councilmember Shapiro. Please vote. Councilmember Cubie. Aye. That motion passes 7 to 0. Next item, 6A4, is approve a one year contract renewal with Rush Truck Centers of Arizona Incorporated for the purchase of refuse vehicles. Is there any comments or discussion on item 6A4? Or can I get a motion on item 6A4? So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Navarro, seconded by Vice Mayor Erdano Savage. Please vote. Councilmember Cubie. Aye. That motion carries 7 to 0. Item 6A5 is to award a one year contract with four one year renewal options for F2 Industries LLC to provide power activated carbon for the removal of organic carbon used by the city of water treatment plants. Is there a motion on item 6A5? Second. It's been moved by Vice Mayor Anano Savage, seconded by Councilmember Keating. Please vote. Councilmember Cubie. Aye. That motion carries 7 to 0. Next item is our non consent agenda and ordinances and items that are for introduction and first hearing. These items will be read and introduced tonight, but no votes will be taken. The second hearings for these votes are scheduled for August 17, 2017. Ordinance and items for introduction and first hearing. Item 6B1 is to introduce and hold the first public hearing to adopt an ordinance authorizing the abandonment of a 20 foot easement for access and public utility purposes located at the southwest corner of Carver Road and 71st Street. The second and final public hearing is scheduled for August 17th. This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us? Could you get my attention? Seeing none, I close that portion of the public hearing. Is there any comments or discussion from the City Council on item 6B1? Seeing none. Item 6B2 is to introduce and hold the first public hearing to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 13, Tempe City Code relating to candidate contribution limits to make conforming changes to the code required by state law changes and to add a requirement for candidates' comments or committees to disclose contributions made by the registered lobbyist. The second and final public hearing is scheduled for August 17th. This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us? Could you please get my attention? If not, any comments or discussion from the council on item 6B2? Seeing none? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councilmember Cubie. Yes, I just wanted to mark that this is a really important initiative for Tempe, and it's just one more step towards a more transparent government and towards a more transparent campaign process. And so for the first time, city council and mayoral candidates will need to disclose in a, in a very clear way that the public can see very clearly um, if they accepted campaign contributions from lobbyists who are registered to lobby with the city of Tempe. Now, that information is possible to find on the website now by looking at campaign finance reports and then looking at the 
list of people registered, but it's not put together in a way where you can ascertain that very easily. You have to kind of be a detective. And so this is just one more step towards a more transparent Tempe, and I salute, I salute the initiative. Okay. Next item is our ordinance and items for second hearing and final adoption. Uh, we'll consider these tonight. Item 6C1 is a hold a second and final public hearing to adopt an ordinance authorizing the abandonment of the remaining portion of a waterline easement located in a baseline road east of Rural Road. Uh, this is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us under item 6C1? Could you please get my attention? Seeing none, look for any comments or discussion from the council. Look for a motion on item 6C1. Moved by Councilmember Granville, seconded by Councilmember Shapiro. Please vote. <coughs> Councilmember Kubi. Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Next item is item 62. Is a hold a second final public hearing to adopt an ordinance authorizing the leasing and conveyance of real property within the Graduate Hotel located at 225 East Apache Boulevard and the execution of related lease documents, including a land and improvements lease and the memorandum of lease. This is a public hearing item. Any comments or discussion on item 6C2? Is there any close out portion? Any comments or discussion from the council on, <coughs> on item 6C2? Is there a motion on item 6C2? It's been moved by Council Member Granville, seconded by Council Member Navarro. Please vote. That motion, oh, Council Member Aye. That motion passes 7 to 0. Item 6C3 is to hold a second and final public hearing to adopt a resolution authorizing a general plan project projected land use map and projected density map amendment to adopt a resolution waiving the accompanying development plan review application and to adopt an ordinance for a zoning map amendment to MUED for ASU Athletic Facilities District's planning area. The applicant is Gamage and Burnham. Uh, I think Ms. Vaz, would you like to make a statement or address us? Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, for your record, my name is Manjula Vaz, law firm of Gamage and Burnham. I'm here on behalf of Patelis, which is the master developer of Athletic Facilities District. Uh, with your permission, I will make a brief presentation. I know we've been talking about this for some time. We've had a couple of open sessions. Just want to make kind of a, give you a, give you a brief overview of where we are and where we're going. I know there's a couple of people who would like to speak, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Um, as you know, and as we've said, this is the outlined red area of the Athletic Facilities District, which is generally bounded by the Town Lake, University on the south, McClintock, and then kind of goes over towards the stadium on the west. I want to talk a little bit about our current steps. We've been spending the last year, I think, with you. We've had a couple of open sessions where we've talked about different ways to approach this project. And certainly we've been working a lot with Ryan and Chad, and we appreciate all their work. Um, what we've done today is kind of break this process up because it's such a, it's a large, we're talking about a large master plan that we developed over the next 30 years. So the first thing we're going to do is do the zoning, which is do a minor general plan amendment, which will bring some of this land in conformance with the current general plan, and then bring all this land into MUED, which is the zoning category that was designed for ASU when it's developing private, when they have, they have private developers want to develop private commercial and residential uses. The next step in the process we've talked about is to develop a text amendment overlay. And that text amendment will talk about development standards and design principles for the district. It will also have infrastructure plans that have been reviewed and approved by the city, which we've been working with both Chad and Don Bessler. And the text amendment will go through the public process. And that will be, you know, again, the whole zoning process. It will go through the DRC and the JRC, go out and talk to the community, show them development standards and design principles. We wanted to bring this and break it up into two separate projects so we can kind of do things in steps and people can comment on it. So just talk briefly about the minor general plan amendment. As you can see here, I think this works. The, oops, it didn't work out. The green area here, what ha in the 2040 general plan, this is the golf course, the northern portion of the golf course was all designated as open space. What we are going to do is change a portion, about 20 acres of the golf course, 
from green to gray, which is mixed use, and then keep this portion of the golf course still as open space where the athletic village will be. What we're trying to do is change a portion of the general plan so that it's consistent with the surrounding general plan uses. The next section, in the general plan, ASU property had, did not have any type of designation on it in terms of density designations. So we are taking the ASU portions of the property that will be developed within the district and consistent with the general plan, this is private property, it's greater than 65, and as the city has pointed out, they would like greater than 65 for density in this area. We are changing portions of the district so that the density designation is consistent with the general plan designation. However, we are planning, we would like to, we're going to work with the city on the density in this area, and we look forward to kind of talking through how the density develops in, in this, along with, in the district. Again, the pictures of the district converting to MUED. Then briefly, I think we've talked about this, and this will be better outlined in the text amendment, but these are the guiding principles that we have kind of developed within the district in terms of sustainability, complete streets, transit-oriented, integrated street networks. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but I know we've all had long discussions about it. Just wanted to give you a sense of what's happening. And then just briefly, I've been talking to the staff about this, but this is the street plan, street network plan that we're developing to help both more east-west streets and north-south streets. Again, again, it'll come back to you as we work through the staff, um, but I think this is a a map that you've all seen before, but this is the street network plan we're working through with the staff. This is a, our bicycle network plan, obviously, bike paths very important to the district, and then kind of an open space plan that we are working through. So that's a very brief presentation of the district. I just wanted to give you the highlights. Today is a very simple process of just doing zoning, zoning and the general plan amendment. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you for that little brief presentation. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. Just real quickly, on the private streets um, that you showed in your slides, are they going to be closed streets? Are they going to be streets that will have public access to go to and from and connect to, to have connectivity to the public streets? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Navarro, they will be public. The public will have access to it. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm sure we'll have some more questions. Okay. Have some cards. So. Got it. Thank you. All right, I have a, a couple cards. Uh, Trevor, please come on down. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. Mayor and Council, Trevor Barter, thank you for the uh, Tempe, Arizona. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening, representing myself and property owners in downtown Tempe, private property owners in downtown Tempe. To be very clear, we are for the development of the urban of the stadium district as a dense urban place. We think it's very appropriate for Tempe. However, we are here tonight proposing, as we did last time we all met, uh, eight additional conditions of approval to the zoning. We urge you not to approve this without the proposed additional conditions of approval. Number three addresses or is designed so that ASU would be required to fulfill their commitments in the IGA that was approved last time the council formal session or for their unlimited height and density that this zoning would currently approve or it would revert the zoning have the ability to revert the zoning in two years. This is important because the IGA is a private agreement. In the IGA, it has no enforcement mechanism. It has no tie to the zoning rights. Also, because per the IGA, ASU can terminate the IGA if the master plan is not approved by Tempe. They can still keep the zoning, however. Zoning, on the other hand, per the Arizona revised statutes, is a right that rides with the property. Not an owner, not a developer. The city must compensate an owner if the right is taken at a later time. Once given, without these additional conditions, ASU has the right to develop without the fulfillment of the IGA requirements. Number 3C and number 7 address residential uses. The master plan and development standards as a requirement of the zoning 
must by state law comply with the general plan. As proposed at 65 plus DU per acre everywhere except for the open space, a minimum, because that category is a minimum density category in our general plan, would be a minimum of 15,000 dwelling units required for the district. That would generate, according to our research, 5,000 K-12 students. These conditions would require ASU to address, as I'm sure they intend to, these school, social, and open space needs. They also ensure that there will be a mix of uses, as I believe they intend to by the master plan, again, not part of this zoning, but talked about at this time, to support the residences in the mixed, in this category, as MUAD is a mixed use zoning category. Number four and number five deal with traffic. As the traffic study is not yet completed, we ask for a bare minimum days downtown and student traffic. Number two, eight, and nine address parity between public and private property owners. We request the JRC advertise meetings the same way the DRC and council are required to, as this, as this zoning would only go through JRC. We also propose that any buildings that are proposed over 90 feet tall on public or private ownership have to come before the council for approval. As an example of the bias against private property owners in this area, when we asked staff how to submit a text amendment to make CC zoning, the downtown zoning district, equal to this condition to limit ASU's limited height, Staff said it is looking to do a master plan for downtown, and such a request would not be appropriate until after the master plan was completed. Uh, there is currently no schedule to complete that master plan. By contrast, on public ownership side, staff is recommending tonight approval of unlimited density and height without the master plan, development standards, or traffic study at this time. They are to come later, but not required by any condition of this zoning. I believe they are intended to come later. I think they just need to be a requirement of this zoning. I urge you not to approve this general plan amendment or rezoning without these additional conditions. Without them, we feel Tempe will be gifting to ASU more than half a billion in land use entitlements without restrictions or clarity about how to pay for or support these uses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, Kim Gaffney, what was that? Kim, come on down. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Kim Gaffney Loza. I live at 206 East Papago Circle South. And um, I'm a layperson. So this is a very complicated project. I, I have seen the designs. I like the designs. Um, I under, my understanding of it is that this is state land and ASU is the steward of this land. And so they really can do what they want with it, but that the um, project, the developers, need the zoning in order to get funding, if, if I'm correct, correct on this. Um, and I have no problem with the development as I've seen it so far, except for the concerns that I emailed you about, which is traffic and how it would impact um, some of our businesses in the area. Um, but I am a little concerned about the no restriction on the density and the height of buildings because I want to see this flow with the rest of the city of Tempe and, and its vision. Um, I think there's a lot of vagueness to this, and then that may be the structure with the JRC. You know, and I may not be understanding this completely, but I just want to make sure that ASU is looking out for its own interest, which is what it should do. I mean, that's its job. But I'm hoping that you guys keep in mind, even though ASU is part of this community, that the rest of the community is also considered in how it's going to impact us. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kim. Next. I have. I I'm pretty sure this is Phil. You look like a doctor's signature. Is that Philip Yates? I think I'm a doctor's signature. 
the doctor's signature is, you know, I think it's matching oh, your jacket. Is, it is a signature, actually. Um, first and foremost. Wait, is that a Ladmo tie? I'm sorry. I'm yes, it is. It's Wallace oh, my gosh. Yes, that's yeah. great. Yes, it is, yeah. Okay. I can see. That's great. And All right. Glad you uh, that is that great. it was Wallace and Ladmo. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> first, um, for me, this is a very sad day. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Riazza's. Oh, yeah. Uh, wonderful, Today wonderful uh, restaurant, wonderful Italian restaurant, probably the one of the, you know, the best uh, by far <laughs> uh, restaurant here. And, uh, and uh, Lucy, uh, Susan Lucy, I'm sorry, Susan Lucy, uh, Miss uh, Riazzi died, Lucy Riazzi, and on Friday, and her wake is this evening. <laughs> Uh, and secondly, I would just like to pay service, to, I mean, tribute to all of our service members in um, our military. It's very important. This is a, a very, very complicated uh, item on this agenda. Uh, and I think we really need to give it a lot more thought. I think we need to involve our community uh, much more than we have, uh, and I didn't, <clears throat> I wasn't able to attend the first meeting uh, when it was uh, under the weather. <laughs> but uh, I would like to I understand that it was uh, unanimously decided upon to move to the second. But um, I would like to ask everybody why they feel that way. Uh, Mr. Shapiro. Yes, I am. Wow. Well, why, why you felt the way you did on the first? To, to move it to a second meeting? No, no, not to move it to a second meeting. Uh, why you felt the way you did in, in voting yes to, to, me, to move it towards the second, to this meeting? Yeah, I mean, it's a... Vote on first. Yeah, we, th this is the vote. Yeah, I know that. I, okay. I know that. I just said I was uh, not able to attend the first one, and I just wanted to know why you voted on. There was no vote. I mean, we don't vote. I'm sorry. When we have a first hearing, we don't vote on the first I know hearing. that. I know that. We are here to vote finally on it, right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, that's why I wasn't able to attend the you first meeting, and yeah. you voted for to move to the second meeting. No? Mr. Yates, uh, I'll just say there, there hasn't been a vote yet. Uh, this is this is the first vote. First hearing, the first hearing is just an opportunity for people to weigh in and offer up changes and ideas. But the the first the vote is tonight. Yeah, I know that. We're not, uh, just so you know, you're supposed to you know make your statements and stuff, and we're supposed to respond after you're done. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I just wanted to know how it got to this point that we haven't really involved with everybody in the uh, decision that is going to take place this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. I think I may be able to address part of the question. By virtue of our process, there, any time an ordinance comes forward, it is required right. to have two hearings. So this is the right. second of the two hearings, and, and there was not it. a right. vote on the first. And not necessarily opinions expressed at that time either. And I think I would defer to the applicant with regard to the number of public meetings and the public outreach that has taken place. Well, I would just say, I'd like to say that I would, and and, and we DRC. sorry that it has gotten to the Phil, point. Phil, just so you know, we, we've had a couple DRC meetings with this for this yes. particular topic, which the public weigh in on. Um, we've had other meetings, with stakeholder meetings with the university and the city and right. members of the community. So. It's already gone through the design review the process, right? And then the last meeting was that we had a meeting was in June, right? the first meeting, the first, meeting the first hearing, June, right? and then now we're taking. Well, everybody action. spoke on how they felt about it uh, on the council. How, this is your time to speak on how you feel about it. Okay. Well, I did have questions for you because I wasn't at the first meeting <laughs> because everybody spoke at the first meeting. Uh, and I just, this is your opportunity as well. Okay. Well, I would just have to say that I oppose the whole 
process. I oppose this because the, this is a huge, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of acres. And we need to have, I mean, I don't know why it didn't get to the public more openly. Because, I mean, DRC meetings, not a whole, uh, not a whole lot of people know about DRC meetings. And uh, uh, that's unfortunate. But um, I, I think that uh, we should in, in, engage in more public activity when it comes to uh, the whole process of this kind of a magnitude of uh, a decision by the council to um, just have this kind of area, hundreds of acres, uh, rezoned so that a lot of things that we are opposed to, I mean, my city council have neighborhood association is opposed to a lot of the uh, things that are going on. Okay. Councilmember Grandma. Mr. Mayor. And then, oh, sorry, I'm Lauren. Councilmember Grandma, then Councilmember QB. I think your time is up. Well, thank you. Okay. I, I want, we're going to address some of your questions. Yeah, we're going to, I want to address some of your questions. So I think the easiest way to do this, because we get this comment from time to time, and typically what happens is the conversation goes something like this. I just heard about this. Why didn't you include the public? And then you go, well, did you get the mailer? No, I don't look at the mail. Did you get the door hanger? I didn't see the door hanger. Did you go to any of the four meetings in the public? I didn't go to the, I didn't know about those meetings. Did you go to the DR? And it, the, it, the system goes on and on. And it, it's not to, to say that, that the person, whoever that may be, you or someone else, it might be one of the first times you've heard about it. But sometimes it's just, it just doesn't filter all the way. And what, I, what I'd like to do is, I know Manjula has been working on this uh, for years now. Could you talk about um, the, the public meetings that you've had, the DRC process, the, the various things, just because I, I, I wouldn't want to leave you with the illusion that this hasn't had a robust public process. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Grandel, thank you for the time. Uh, yeah, so as you know, we've been certainly working on this for years, and we've been to two, um, we're just with the council, we've been to two public um, IRS sessions, issue review sessions that have been down, down, down here. Was, there was two. There's one here. Well, there was two. There was one here, and then we had one public meeting at the Don Cassano room, if you remember. But there, those are two public meetings. In terms of the, so that's just with the council, certainly, in the, in the outreach. In terms of the outreach, We've had, you know, the red signs have been posted. We had a neighborhood meeting, um, and Kim can certainly attest. I've been to North Tempe two or three times. Any of these guys can attest because I've talked to them yes. three times about it. Um, and then we, right, you guys will defend me on that. And um, certainly I'm going to talk to Ron Tapscott next week, or not next week, um, in three weeks, but I'm going to the Tempe TIS group um, in August to talk about it. And then, you know, we've, got, we've been to the two DRC meetings, two JRC meetings, in the, and we may have been actually three DRC meetings. So we've done several study sessions with the DRC. Then we had a public vote with the DRC. We had two sessions with the JRC. Um, so, you know, to the extent that we could talk to people, we were happy to. And if anybody would like to keep talking to me, I'm happy to. Um, again, you know, this is just a zoning, so we're going to we're continuing to move forward, and we're happy to talk to anybody. That's okay, no. Councilmember Keating. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Voss. I have uh, a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I want to talk about the, the traffic uh, situation in particular. I understand that you've been working with staff on traffic plans for circulation around the district. Um, as you move forward with those plans, can you reach out to uh, interested community members and show them the plans to get any necessary feedback? Ne uh, necessary feedback from and as far as the traffic perspective goes moving forward? Yes, oh, of course. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Keating, of course we'll do that. Okay. That'll be part of, certainly part of, the largest part of our uh, next text amendment as we kind of talk through the street network. And I think okay. it's Councilman Noir. So. Great. And uh, really quickly, in terms of notification of the public, uh, can you work with staff to see if there's any potential notification procedures that we could add to the text amendment uh, in the overlay? Sure. No, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Keating, I'm happy to kind of work with the staff. I think we, as we've talked a little bit, there's some issues we need to talk about because the notification procedures are codified in the ordinance. Right. So I think we need to kind of work with some of the planning staff and the city attorney and talk about how that notification procedure can be 
um, maybe enhanced a little bit for the overlay area. Great. Thank you. That point, though, and I know it was a comment, I think, by Trevor, said, we know there's a lot of procedures in the future that will recover some of this, but the JRC does advertise um, for meetings that are in the public. The JRC, yes, the, is a public meeting. Right, and we do, and they do advertise it. Yeah, they, they advertise. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I got two more cards. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Yes. Mayor? Councilman QB. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to re re reiterate to Phil uh, that there were two working sessions held with the council. They were open issue review sessions. And I know uh, Mandela mentioned that, but I mean, it is true that in terms of notification, this, this was different than a regular zoning case because there are no immediate neighbors that are in close proximity. Uh, the development does not back up directly to neighborhoods. And so that explains why there's a little bit of a difference, but there were many times where there was public input that was welcome. And it's important to know, like we, we do, the city has um, supported and is supporting density on the lake and density in downtown, and but it's very contextual about where that density should be. And there is an existing process and there will be a process within the city to review these types of requests for density in downtown, and this is just the beginning of the process. It's just the beginning of the zoning. And this is you know, something to tell us, ASU, city staff, council have been working on for over a year and um, has been evident from all the descriptions of all the different public engagements and meetings. Okay, thank you. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, I just, um, and I appreciate everyone's comments because I think everyone has concern, especially on, as we move forward and on this district and how impactful it's going to be and, and I think we're excited about it at the same time I think for our retreat um, and I believe we kind of bring this up a little bit every year about the height in our downtown area and I think we are going to talk about it at our retreat I hope um, that what's our minimum what's our maximum height and have that conversation because uh, as we move into this you know new age of where we're going how we're going if we go below 90 feet then we're kind of tied to probably stick and stucco uh, if we go above that, maybe not. So there's a conversation that needs to be had here, and I hope we, we have the opportunity with staff to address it at our retreat. Thank you. All right, Deb, Dean Bailey, come on down. I'm talking about the, the, you want the notes? Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that this is a difficult thing with a lot of um, loose ends to tie up. Um, personally, I have some concerns for traffic, um, and that's with everything that goes in because it's just getting worse and worse, and just to keep it in mind. Um, there is some concern that if it becomes a stadium, um, what happens with parking at Tempe Marketplace? And I, I don't know that we can decide that. And Will we turn Tempe Marketplace into a big dollar store because we don't, we have all the, the parking at Tempe Marketplace for what goes on at the stadium district. So that's a concern um, because we all like Tempe Marketplace and <laughs> we'd rather go there than other places. I can ride Me my too. bike there. We do too. I can, I can go to Pet Smart with my trailer. <laughs> so so um, um, east and west traffic is a concern because we cut through the school a lot of times to get here. So I don't, I don't know if you understand how sometimes Mill Avenue is backed up and so we'll take rural and we'll cut through the school. And if we had to take university, it would be even harder to get here. Um, <laughs> and yes, I take orbit as often as I can, but times like tonight, the time just did not permit. Um, so east-west traffic is important to us in North Tempe. Um, police and fire, I, I know there's an agreement to agree, um, but I, I, I have concerns if we have unlimited height and we have a fire department that has to service unlimited height and what is the cost and how is that going to be arranged and is the rest of Tempe going to absorb that and subsidize it or I mean yes there it's something that needs to be done but that that's a huge jump from what we have today so um, I, I, I'm a little paranoid there when we dial 911 I'm told that the ASU police will go there but Really, all the time? I mean, if it's just regular mixed-use multifamily, is it going to be ASU police or is it going to be regular police? And I just want to, I haven't seen any numbers, and I'm a numbers person, so I would love to see some. And I understand it's not all there, but I hope it's kept in mind. I really appreciate it. 
Um, and then these people will be able to vote, but they won't pay property taxes. So our voted indebtedness as far as for, now David, I think you sent me something that with the schools, our, our, our um, override bonds will be taken care of. But um, what about the other stuff? You know, road repairs, new infrastructure for water department, new infrastructure for storm drains, etc. Anyway, that's it. I really appreciate it and um, thank you. Thank you, Deb. I'm glad I'm not you. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not you. Deborah Zajac. Come on down, Deborah. The Deb Show. Deborah Zajac. I live at 1711 North McAllister in North Tempe and Yes, we've had numerous presentations, and I, I do support this project. My only concern is with the, the zoning and how I'm understanding it, how it goes with the property, and so many other things are just not clear. They're just up in the air, and that will be worked out later, and I'm just concerned about that, and that if we were more clear about that, or these, like Trevor called it, the conditions, if things were just spelled out more clearly, um, as opposed to just changing the zoning and then because like that goes with the property no matter who owns it and other things just aren't worked out whether it's the paying for you know ser city services or just anything like that I just feel that we're doing the zoning with other things that are unclear and that if ASU is going to be a good neighbor that we should work together and they should be willing to have those things outlined more clearly before we actually change the zoning. That's all. But I'm not, I'm not that I'm against this project. That's not my point. It's just I think other things need to be spelled out more clearly before we implement the zoning change. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else in the audience wishing to address us on this public hearing item? I'm out of cards. All right. Seeing none, I'll ask the applicant to come back forward, Mr. Vaz. Answers, I mean, I, and just so everyone knows, I mean, we appreciate all the comments because we do take this into consideration. We have, which is why I know Ms. Vaz is going to address a lot of those. Um, traffic is a big issue for us. We, we're engaging in the traffic study as we speak. It's part of the reason why we're moving forward with um, a streetcar. Eventually, we want to take it all the way down towards Mesa. But we are, this is something that we're very, recon we're recognizing all issues that have been before you what you all have mentioned so i think it's important to note that we have taken noted some of the stuff is being clarified and i'll hand it back over to the module about miss oh. <laughs> uh mr mayor um we, no uh, thank you mr mayor i appreciate everybody's comments and certainly um we've had long conversations with them and i i understand obviously it's a it's a big project and you know in city the city of tempe we don't typically do large master plans um but so we're taking our time and so we've broken up this process i mean the first step is putting it into MUD, which is the zoning category for ASU. All the projects are not just going to poop. We're, they're going to go individually through the planning department while we're working the text amendment. First, our next step, as I mentioned, is to do a text amendment. Let me back up for a second. And the text amendment will, will talk about some of the development standards and design principles of the district. And that will be going through the regular public process. And so that will answer some of the questions. And, and as Deb mentioned, and They've all mentioned that they've seen so I've shown them some of the building heights and we're going to take that back to the public process. I'm certainly happy to show whoever would like to see it. You get a sense of what's coming. Then each individual project is going through the city planning department. So both the planning department will be able to review it. Public Works is going to review it. The same project, the same process that happens with every project is going to happen on a project by project basis. And then based on our traffic study, you know, they will tell us what types of, you know, in tra traffic improvements to make and XYZ and they'll go through the same city process as other projects. This doing zoning tonight does not mean you're going to have a bunch of buildings. It's just the first step of a process. The next step is going to be to codify some principles and then we'll start developing the district. So I mean with that I'm happy to answer more questions but I mean as you all know it's been a, a long time and we have a lot of time ahead of us. Thank you. Any other comments or discussions from Ms. Vaz? I do want to thank you for Pointing out the process that this in which this will go through. So it's going to be on a project by project basis. You're going to have public hearings. It's going to go through the JRC. It's no different than how the JRC is set up now. And then there will be public notice. And, and, and just for everyone's sake, you know, this council and even previous councils, this council really does care about the process. We care about transparency. We care about what individual residents have said. We respect property rights. We respect private property owners as well. And I know 
that's something I just want to reiterate because we do take that into account in how we master plan um, our community, which is really following the lines that I even think, I don't know if it was one of the devs or Kim said it, where we look at the proposed density map that we have and, mm -hmm. and we understand it. And, and they've been, you guys have been at the meetings to the North Tempe neighborhoods, that, which um, is, has concerns as the council does. But as we move forward, we're going to continue to address those issues as we move forward on a project-by-project -project basis based on the current zoning procedures we have in place. Yes, and we're, we're happy to work with Council on density and traffic. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Vaz? So, on the, we, we have to have three votes on this item. So the first vote, I look for a motion on a resolution authorizing a general plan, a general plan projected land use map and projected density map amendment. That's, there, there's three votes that we have to take. Yes, Councilmember Grandville. Uh, Mayor, I just want to speak very briefly on this. I spoke at our last meeting about it, so I'm not going to sort of beat a dead horse. Um, I've had a chance to talk to Ms. Vaz. I've known her now for five years. I've been on council, uh, maybe before that, just from being zoning attorney, hanging out in silly circles. Uh, and also the people from ASU. And I, I know that they do really great projects. The developer they've selected does really great projects. So long term, I, I don't have long term concerns about the quality of the project or the sort of quality of the master plan. The, the issue that I have is the same issue that I had before, um, the reason I voted for the, the, the things a month ago now, and that is the, the it's, you know, I've, I've said this in jest, but it's, it, it, the spirit of it's sort of true. The zoning is the thing, right? And so once the zoning is done, we, we're still gonna negotiate, and I absolutely agree that ASU and Tempe will negotiate in good faith, to deal with density and to deal with traffic and to deal with how we pay the firefighters that can go and, and deal with 15,000 people and how we're going to deal with pay the police that are going to go and deal with 15,000 people and all of these things. Um, but it's, uh, or what happens when people vote on city bonds, but they, they don't actually fall within the city. So they're voting on bonds they don't even pay for. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on like that. And it seems a little bit odd to me. It would be like if I went to a car dealership and I said, let me have the car, and I'll come back in a week, and we've got an agreement to negotiate in good faith for the value of the car. Well, now, I've got the car now. Like, we may negotiate in good faith, but I got the car. And in my mind, the car is the zoning here. And so I have no doubt that both ASU and the city of Tempe will negotiate in good faith. Once you've got the zoning, like, you've got the car. Like, we... We, 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 I think, will be dealing from a, while we're all good friends and partners over, uh, you know, decades, 100 years plus, uh, I, I feel like we'll be now negotiating from a greatly diminished capacity in those negotiations. And for that reason, I, I'm not comfortable providing that zoning. Uh, the, the offer that I talked about before, when I understand there's not the votes here where you need to worry about it, is that we come up with some sort of flat fee for two years so that, uh, and one that you probably wouldn't even like because it's probably too high, knowing that, look, we're just going to come back and as we go forward, we'll come up with the right fee. And so the negotiations we'll be doing will be happening in a way where, um, where you know, there's something already happening. I don't have huge concerns over the project. It's just the reason I'm voting no. Uh, but I certainly know that long term, this is going to be good for ASU and it's going to be good for Tempe. Vice Mayor Donald Savage. I, you know, thank you, Mayor. I just, just a couple of things I want to reiterate, and I know we've all had the opportunity to talk about this over many, many months. Um, but first and foremost, I just really want to say thank you so much to uh, ASU uh, for, you know, just always being really good partners and Contellus and Gamage and Burnham and, of course, the City of Tempe and the staff. Um, but I really want to kind of just pinpoint a couple of people that I think have really worked extremely hard and carried a lot of water, and I and that's um, Alex and Angela. I just want to say that uh, it's, it's just really remarkable, your persistence and uh, passion to really bring this together and create a really phenomenal project moving forward in the future. And I know it hasn't been easy, and I will definitely agree with Kim when she says this is complicated. Yes, this is very complicated, and it has been complicated, and I think everybody's done their best to be able to bring us a really good compromise that we can move forward with because we all want the same thing. And the same thing is not only to have a really incredible facilities district that's great for the area, but it's great for our residents. It's really great for the community as a whole and that we all benefit from it. 
Um, I will say too, I think what we've heard tonight isn't anything different that this council hasn't been aware of and, and continually has pushed for when it comes to public safety, when it comes to infrastructure. And I'm going to add this in there because nobody mentioned it is traffic is a really big deal and around downtown. I think it is, is, is very complicated now in the sense of trying to make sure that we're doing everything that we can. And I know that uh, Shelly Seiler and her team are working really hard to make sure that traffic um, is as less congested as it possibly can be. But saying that too, it's not only important that we talk about the Tempe traffic study, but the urban core study that I know um, uh, Steve Methman is working on too, how important that is to incorporate it with what we're doing down the road um, to make sure that those things are also incorporated. Because I certainly think that when it comes to parking, traffic, and just overall master planning, it's really important that we have a cohesive structure. So I really do appreciate the work of everybody that's that's come to this point. And I, everybody says, says this is the first step. I don't really think it's the first step because I feel like we've taken a lot of steps. This is the first action step. And I think it's, per, is it perfect? Probably not, but I think it's, it's a pretty doggone good compromise to get us going to that next step. So I know we're gonna work on it. We've got a lot of things. I appreciate uh, the residents continually to be passionate about what they believe in. And, and I think a lot of us agree with that. And I think we're gonna continue to push as we move forward with our next action steps, that those things are included in that. So um, with that, I'm really looking forward to um, seeing this project get some legs and start moving down the road and really working on more of the details as we go but it's a 30-year project this is nothing that's going to happen overnight and i know we're going to continue to work at it to make sure it is the best best project that it possibly can be moving forward so um with that i i will be supporting um, this item these items tonight thank you mayor yes councilman Noir. thank you mayor um yeah, you know, I, I just listen to everyone and, and, and soaking in all concerns. Obviously, we want a great project, and obviously, it's been set up here that um, we have to. We have, it's very difficult and very complicated to um, address this, and we've been working on it for several years. In fact, we've flown back to Austin to see projects from Catellus and what they've done in their master plan communities. And I have to say that um, I was literally blown away on on their thoughtfulness of planning in an area, master plan area. I was, I was actually blown away by what they put into. Um, developing a community and the fact that I have confidence in what they can develop gives me a little bit um, better uh, uh, understanding of, but it gives me uh, uh, that ability to take that I don't want to say gamble but to take that first step and, and, and Colby and I mentioned that give, uh, buying a car and now that you got the car it's gone um, I kind of see it as you got the engine you still got to build the car um, without a zoning agreement we can't build a project you know, we have to have zoning to build a project and to build what we want and how we want it. So we still have steps to go as we build this car, so to speak. Um, so, you know, with, with the product, with the relationship, we always, always have to be, have a partnership with ASU. Um, someone's got to put, you know, the first foot in and, and take the steps forward. Um, we expect that that partnership walks together, so to speak. So I'm very um, supportive of this project. I know there's a lot of concerns always with every project that we go through. Um, but we really want to um, develop something that's going to be very unique for this area. It's going to be very unique for the state, to be honest with you, and, and, and what we're trying to do in this downtown area. So with that, I'll be voting support of it. I do understand the concerns. I know we have opportunities to address some of the concerns even in our retreat and some of the concerns as we do it on the road. Traffic is always going to be a concern. hate to say this, but um, we are going to have traffic problems. Uh, it's going to happen, but we also are going to have a walkable, livable, um, just 100% enjoyable city that everyone's attracted to, to in, in addition. That's why you have traffic. Um, so with that, I'll be supporting us. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilmember Cuby. So I would like to weigh in a little bit on the transportation issues, a particular interest of mine, but um, so, you know, there's a lot of questions and concerns about vehicular traffic. And we know from uh, talking to Catellus, the master developer, that Dorsey Lane, for example, will extend north of University over to McClintock with access to the 101. So it will be a north-south artery. Forestry will be a major east-west artery beginning at Dorsey and going west to Packard. And so there's going to be lots of improvements made to arterial streets with additional right and left turn lanes and such. There's going to be a new grid for interior circulation to take the pressure off those uh, 
major arteries. And there's been a lot of time, you know, over a year well, that I'm aware of, but probably longer from the Catellus and ASU point of view, but creating an interconnected bike path network and protected bike lanes, not just ordinary bike lanes, but protected lanes with uh, common bike lanes in the street. And then there's been a lot of attention paid to pedestrian circulation uh, with livability, mobility, safety in mind. So, I mean, I think this, yeah, you're right, um, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Ardon Savage, this isn't the very first step. It's the first maybe big step, but I'm very excited. We're going to see a, a technologically advanced, sustainable, mixed-use connected community, and it is the future, and um, I'm excited to be a part of it. So I will be voting yes. Councilman Shapiro. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> you know, I want to say there's, there's a lot of times that we have a public process on something controversial, not controversial, and uh, the initial product is the same as the final product. And sometimes it, it ends up kind of looking like a token process. This was not an example of that. This was a long public process that included a lot of feedback and a lot of changes. And I appreciated ASU's willingness to negotiate with us, to negotiate with uh, our folks in our community. And we did make a lot of changes and tweaks throughout this process. And I, and I just wanted to thank the folks from ASU for being willing to work with us um, and being accommodating to some of the changes that some of us have recommended. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate, we thank everyone for being involved. I mean, we thank obviously ASU as being the partner they are. But I just want to reiterate the zoning, just as we do our general plan amendment that our citizens, that our general plan voting or 2040 or 2030 and 3040 coming up, we always look at zoning and how that works throughout the city. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. We're zoning this area for the density, for the mixed use education zoning that they're looking for. And and I think it, this is an appropriate area. We all have recognized that. So this is a, you know, we are going to have an opportunity. The buildings still need to be designed. They still need to be built. But in, as we move forward, the public is going to be part of that process. So I just want to reiterate that again. And it's, this is a good process in terms of understanding, um, having the give and take between ASU and the city of Tempe and our residents. Um, and as been clearly mentioned by this council tonight, there's been a lot of public process meetings. And we're not done. This is, we're never going to be done until it, we are constantly redeveloping redevelopment projects. And that, I can honestly say that living here my entire life because we're redeveloping redevelopment projects. And, and being a part of this, I think it's a good opportunity as we move forward to continue to engage the partnership that we have with ASU as we move forward for those right types of buildings and uses that we're looking at. So with that, I look for a motion. So we have three motions, three votes that we have to take on this item. The first one, I look for a motion, a resolution authorizing general plan, projected land use map and projected density map amendments. Is there a motion for that motion? So moved. moved by Vice Mayor Erdano Savage. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Navarro. Please vote. Councilman McCubey. Aye. That motion carries six to no with or six to one with Councilman Grandma voting no. The second vote I will need is a motion of resolution waiving the accompanying development plan review application and a second. That's why I need a second for that. So I have to have a motion on the resolution waiving the accompanying development plan review application. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Keating and seconded by Vice Mayor Edondo Savage. Please vote. Councilmember Cubey. Aye. That motion passes six to one with Councilmember Granville voting no. The third motion we're looking for is, is on the ordinance for a zoning map amendment for the MUED for ASU Athletic Facilities District Planning Area. So I look for a motion on the ordinance for a zoning map amendment to MUED for ASU's Athletic Facilities District Planning Area. It's been moved by Councilmember Keating, seconded by Councilmember Navarro. Please vote. That motion, Councilman QB? Aye. That motion carries six to one with Councilman Granville voting no. Okay. Next item, item 6C4. Is pursuant to the federal law, hold the second and final public, the final two public hearings to receive public comments 
and to adopt a resolution regarding the annual community development block grant and home investment partnerships program action plan for fiscal year 2017-18. This, this is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address this under item 6C4? Any none? Is there any comments or discussion from the council or a motion on item 6C4? Moved. moved by Council Member Keating. Is there a second? That is, it's seconded by Vice Mayor Hernando Savage. Please vote. Council Member Cubie. Aye. That motion passes 7 to 0. Next is our current events and council announcements. Council Member Fire. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I am excited to uh, present my colleagues with a, an award that our city received uh, at the Child Abuse Prevention Conference that uh, uh, Marie Raymond and Anlin D. Domenico and myself attended this week. Um, it is the Everyday Heroes Award presented to the city of Tempe uh, for the passage of our Tempe Free Program. So very exciting that we were able to get this award. It was a conference attended by, I want to say, there were like a thousand people there. It was a huge, huge event. And uh, the folks at this conference really highlighted the connection between uh, access to high quality preschool for especially poor families and the, the positive impact <laughs> that has on reducing child abuse. And so uh, I just wanted to announce that we received this great award and uh, present it to, our, to my colleagues on the committee. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Granville. Uh, nothing, Mayor. It's good to be home. Vice Mayor Donald Savage. Um, um, thank you, Mayor. Just really quick, I had the opportunity. I know you were out of town. I just thought I'd just show a quick shout out to the uh, the Tempe Sister Cities, the youth delegates. They're all in town, as you can see. A cool, couple of really cool photos. I think this was at the dinner that you were at. Um, and their tour, I think they were going to the Grand Canyon, but they're, you can't see it in here, but their bus broke down and it turned out being like an eight hour trip oh, back. <laughs> like, welcome to Tempe. Okay, okay. So anyway, the kids were really great and phenomenal. And I just thought that you guys would want to take a second to take a look at, um, you know, some of these really wonderful students that really are, ch are changing the world because it's just, you know, changing the world one friendship at a time, which is the mission of Tempe Sister Cities. And, and these guys uh, were really remarkable and it was just fun to be a part of it this last week. And um, we were height. Yeah, I had to stand on my tippy toes. <laughs> They're really tall, so it worked out good. Were they all dressed Mayors that way in the first picture? Because they think that's how we dress. Yeah, well, it's like kind of like their half. They're all mixed in there. So no, it worked the first out pretty good. Western night. The cowboy. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's a Western, no, it's a no. Night. It was just a couple of different options. They they're, they're, they're welcome dinner, and then their trip to, and then this was the the luncheon. So it was really nice. So thank you, Frank. Appreciate that. And then I just want to say uh, uh, welcome back. I think to not Colby. I mean, oh yeah, to Colby. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, but actually, back to school. I think we're not going to have a meeting before school starts here in the city of Tempe. So I just want to say welcome back to not only uh, the educators, the staff members, but to the students and to the parents. I know I'm being a parent. Yes. Welcome back to school. So anyway, I hope you guys all have a really wonderful uh, back to school and a really wonderful uh, school year. That's it, Mayor. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, real quick, we, uh, Robin Arredondo and I, will be hosting a HILO conference, which is from we the will. National League of Cities. It's our Hispanic elected officials conference we do once uh, every year, summer retreat. This year, Tempe will be hosting it. Um, we'll be having delegates uh, from across the country um, come into Arizona. We're going to be talking about our sustainability, our economic growth, our you know, our potential of more growth that we're doing in the downtown and how we're handling it and kind of give a history of where Tempe is or where Tempe has come and where it is now and how we are trying to achieve what we want to hopefully achieve down the road, making this a livable, walkable city. In addition to that, um, our other focus will be on uh, immigration and um, what immigration has in store for us, so to speak. We're really going to take an in-depth in look on uh, the issue. Uh, we'll have a panel from customs agents, uh, border patrols, uh, sheriff's departments, a um, whole variety of different people um, that will be weighing in on the issue. In addition to that, we'll be talking about um, business within Mexico and the opportunities that um, uh, south of our border that uh, we can have, we can establish connections, establish those relationships, and really develop 
and harness um, good economic opportunity um, within our cities. And we want to show them um, those opportunities by taking a trip down to Nogales. Uh, we'll be taking a one-day trip to Nogales. We'll be taking a, bo a border tour. Um, we'll be asking those questions about immigration, customs. We'll be walking through the process um, to really get a real true understanding of uh, what the border wall is and what we need to know. Um, so I think this is going to be a real uh, good conversation. It's going to be eye-opening for a lot of people because uh, for a lot of the people that are going to be coming across um, all parts of the country, all um, very small, big, and large um, cities um, to talk about this issue. So it's going to be a well-received conference. Um, we're excited about the topic. We're excited about the opportunity to go down there. Um, we're excited about the relationships we'll, we'll be making um, on our visit and then coming back up here uh, to uh, um, see them off. So um, we're looking for a great tour. Uh, it's going to be uh, in two weeks, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity for Tempe to host such a uh, great event. Good job. We to represent. All right, Mr. Keating. Uh, nothing for me, Mayor. Thank you. The only thing I, I, I a couple things. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Oh, Councilmember QB, sorry. Yes. Well, tonight we passed with a little fanfare the uh, Bridge to Permanency program, and it's about nearly $300,000 coming from Mercy Maricopa Integrated Care and the Regional Behavioral Health Authority. And I just wanted to just acknowledge that this will be a permanent supportive housing program for homeless individuals with severe mental illness and they're our most vulnerable citizens. And uh, this effort has been long in duration. The working group, uh, the Housing First Working Group has been working on this project. So I want to salute Council Member Joel Navarro and Randy Keating. And most of all, um, our staff member, our homeless coordinator, Kim Vandenwegen. She's been working on this for just I think nearly nine months, and it was just painstaking, but it's bringing $300,000 of support and resources to our chronic homeless population. So thank you to staff for all the work that, that, that involved. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Anything else? All right. I, I just have a couple comments. One, I want to recognize a longtime employee. She's retired. Her name is Kay Savard. She's been with us for three decades. Uh, she's, she will be missed. And uh, good luck with your retirement, Kay. And then also this Saturday is really exciting because we are reopening McClintock Pool. For those that don't know, um, it's been closed, but we're actually reopening it. This is where I can honestly say that's where I learned how to swim as a kid. It's so exciting to see that uh, reopen to the public. Um, and that will be at 530. And you get to see, our. I don't know, I think most of the council is going to be jumping in the pool. Swimsuits. And it would be great at a McClintock pool. No Speedos. Okay. What? I don't think that would be, that would not be pretty. All right. <laughs> That's not a good visual. Okay. <laughs> With that being said, we'll close the public comments on that, and then we do have our public appearances. So according to the Arizona Open Meeting Law, the City Council may only discuss matters listed on this agenda. Matters discussed by the public during public appearances cannot be discussed by the City Council unless they are specifically listed on this agenda. There is a three-minute time limit for, uh, for per speaker, and speaker's visual aids are not allowed. Members of the public shall refrain from making any personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks uh, while attending this meeting or addressing this council. Unauthorized remarks will... From the audience, uh, clamping, stomping of feet, yelling actually would result in removal of the city council chambers. With that, we do not have any uh, scheduled public appearances tonight. And there are unscheduled pu public appearances. I have one card, Mr. Martinez. Good evening. My name is Mario Martinez, and I live in MP. In regards to Kobe Granville's uh, second consecutive ethics violation, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the ethical majority in the city council, to the outside council, to the city attorney, and all other staff members for their, their efforts in effectively trying to resolve these matters. We are all different citizens with different ideas. The one thing that we have in common is that our actions did not precipitate this regrettable situation. 
It was Kobe's actions and Kobe alone who chose to violate the personnel code and the code of ethics on these two separate occasions. He bears full responsibility for these actions, whether he chooses to financially pay up or not. In addition to being a council member, Kobe is also an attorney. Unfortunately, as a result of Kobe's ethical transgressions, the following actions have occurred. One, legal ineptitude exercised by Kobe. Two, Kobe's abusive actions. Three, Kobe's duplicitous explanations for what happened in the first place. These actions by Kobe cost our hardworking taxpayers over $20,400 in legal bills so far. By comparison, Kobe is paid slightly more than $29,000 per year to serve on the council, while we get to shell out $20,000 for his legal bills. This is ridiculous. It is Kobe's moral responsibility to help pay these costs, either financially or by performing, uh, 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 but performing community service as restitution. So far, Kobe has not displayed the moral backbone to tell our city whether he will voluntarily pay or not. This is true even though, according to his own campaign finance report, Kobe stuck $15,000 into his wallet after taking it out of his campaign fund a little over a year ago. If Kobe does not pay his legal bills, he will look like an unethical government big spender and not the fiscal conservative that he claims to be. The choice is Kobe's and the taxpayers are watching and we are also paying at the same time. Thank you. Is anyone else in the audience wishing to address us under unscheduled public appearances? Could you please get my attention? Seeing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. No, no. Okay, we have one more brief meeting. We're going to have a special meeting for the Tempe City Council for July 27, 2017. Uh, we would like to hold a second and final public hearing to adopt the fiscal year 2017-18 property tax ordinance. The first public hearing was held on June 8, 2017. This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience Wishing to address this, could you please get my attention? Seeing none, I close that portion of the public hearing. Any comments or discussion from the council? Or is there a, can I get a motion to adopt ordinance number 02017.38? So moved. Second. moved by Council Member Keating, seconded by Vice Mayor Ernando Savage. Please vote. Council Member Keating, are you still there? Aye. That motion carries seven to zero. Thank you, Lauren. With that, we are adjourned.